Hello, I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Joining me tonight for a conversation that I'm very excited about is the poet, legal scholar, and my good friend, Reginald Dwayne Betts. We're excited to have you with us for this conversation about the transformational power of books and about our vision for the Million Book Project. Since you can see us, but alas, we cannot see you, we would love to know who you are, where you're from, and why you're excited to be part of our conversation. So if you could say hi in the comments, we would be most grateful. In a few minutes, Dwayne and I will talk about books and reading and the spaces where books and reading come together from libraries to independent bookstores have shaped us both as poets and scholars and thinkers and in our way, freedom fighters. But before we begin our conversation, I'd like to share some context on how Dwayne and I first began thinking uh, together and separately and together again about the power of books. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a very short history of reading, liberation, and prison libraries, and how that reflection led to the creation of the Million Book Project. In our country, the denial of the access to freedom granted by literacy and books runs right through uh, from the 18th century slavery through 21st century incarceration. Slaves who learned to read gained a means to liberation. The moment where they could read was the moment when they could imagine freedom. And this is documented over and over again in our great slave narrative tradition. As the former slave and mighty abolitionist Frederick Douglass himself once noted, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Among the books in Douglass's own library were The American Constitution, The Complete Works of Shakespeare, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth. If you go to his library in Cedar Hill in Anacostia, in the town Washington, D.C., where Dwayne and I both grew up, uh, you will find his amazing and overstuffed library with many books opened to the places where he was reading them when he died. As the books in his library illustrate, reading and exposure to new ideas gives us opportunities to contemplate life through other minds and other manners of thinking. Books open an imaginative intellectual path forward for us all while strengthening our sense of self and honing our ability to think critically about the world around us. A little history of prison libraries. When libraries in American prisons first took shape in the late 19th century, they did so with a rehabilitative ideal, not an imaginative or an intellectual one. Reformers who helped create these libraries hoped they would produce good Christians and promote docility among prison population. So as a result, books were used and access to books were used as a reward for good behavior. The books themselves were chosen by prison administrators and were selected on the basis of their perceived worth in furthering reformative goals. Unfortunately, the idea that books can influence human behavior still impacts debates today in a different way about the censorship of materials in prison libraries. Throughout the 20th and early 21st century, as professional librarians began to work in American prisons, and as libraries were built in state correctional facilities as well as federal ones, and as formal guidance from the American Library Association was developed, including a prisoner's bill of rights, the concept of reading as an intellectual pursuit in prison gained broader support. The right to read has since entered the discourse around prison libraries. These libraries can now be seen as spaces for recreation and knowledge attainment rather than just as rooms for discipline and rehabilitation. Uh, and just to go back a bit um, to when we talked about the slave narratives and literature and the idea of literacy as freedom, something that you'll probably be familiar with that takes us forward to this century as well is a book like The Autobiography of Malcolm X and even the extraordinary filmic uh, uh, version of that where uh, Malcolm X's uh, learning to be a critical reader and a deep reader in prison is also concomitant with his understanding of, of freedom and transformation. So still though, by and large, uh, incarcerated people in the United States today do not have access to great books uh, by, by, uh, by any definition. And there are several reasons for this. Tough on crime rhetoric has had greatly detrimental imp impacts on prison libraries. And at the same time, the effort to donate books to prisons has become extremely complex. 
Books are also banned at the individual level, the prison-wide level, and at the statewide level. And even when books do make their way into prison libraries, rules on paper about access to these books can different, differ considerably from what actually plays out in practice. Despite these challenges, we believe that access to great books, uh, and we'll talk about um, uh, uh, Dwayne's idea of, of what great books are, because that, of course, is uh, it ha has a million fascinating answers with a lot of interesting politics around them. We believe that access to great books is imperative for the millions of our fellow human beings who are incarcerated in our country's uh, prisons. Um, a key question that helped guide us um, as we talked and talked about the Million Book Project uh, was this one. If the highest purpose of incarceration is rehabilitation, how can books help those who are incarcerated further develop the inner resources that they will need when they return to their communities? Put simply, by providing access to great books, the Million Books Project supports the efforts of incarcerated people to deepen and envision their lives in new ways, uh, a right that uh, should be uh, a right for every human being. Uh, these books thus serve as a vital mean to freedom of the mind. So um, to set this up, uh, and this is Dwayne's project, so I'll set this up uh, and, uh, and he will uh, have many more things to say about it. Um, the Million Book Project, Dwayne's Million Book Project, will bring 500 book collections into every medium and maximum security men's prison, all women's prisons, and at least one juvenile detention center in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. That is one of my favorite sentences to speak, that one that I just spoke to you. Taken together, the project will reach a total of 1,000 prison facilities. There will also be created out of this project a catalog of essays and reflections that will both document the project and introduce readers to the books in the collection. A nationwide reading series will be curated and will bring writers or scholars into prisons and juvenile detention centers in Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and each one of the 50 states. We will hold both an opening convening and a closing celebration as well as virtual uh, and in-person when we get there, inside out conferences to celebrate, reflect and engage with the project. From the perspective of the Mellon Foundation, I wanna be clear that the Million Book Project is a genuinely new undertaking for us. It is a brand new initiative uh, created in the here and now, not part of an extant entity or institution. Fundamentally, uh, and uh, these are, are, um, are Dwayne's words from the proposal, the Million Book Project is a reckless kind of ode to study, experimentation, and self-creation. It facilitates the building and rebuilding of independent communities in prison, uh, and that is very important, the way that um, having read the same books and being able to talk about them uh, is something that makes communities wherever we are. Uh, communities where, and this again to quote Duane, where study and reading have no destination that we can point towards besides freedom. So now it is my great pleasure to turn to Duane Betts and begin our conversation. Hey, hello. This is a this was this was a pleasure, and this was that was an amazing presentation. I was listening, and thinking I would love to be a part of that. <laughs> <laughs> How about it? Yeah, but, but the history uh, is fascinating. Um, I think. Oh, I think it's the history is fascinating, but also, um, at least for me, having served a lot of time in prison, what I find fascinating about the project is it both elucidates some of that history. And it gives so many different actors within the system and outside of the system to revise the way we approach this thing in the past. And so like right now, the earliest responders to the New York Times article wasn't really just people in the public congratulating me. Although I had friends congratulating me and congratulating us, it was prison librarians saying, wait a minute, how do I get in line to make sure that this comes into my institution? And so I think part of what this project does is it's a lot of hurt, it's a lot of suffering, and it's a lot of conflicted emotions about how we think about prison and incarceration. 
most of us have never really been involved with anything outside of raising children that everybody agree with. You know, it's nobody that disagrees with like getting formula for a baby. And I think in our professional careers, that's doubly true. But this here seems to be an instance where everybody can say, wait a minute, I'm behind this. This is a powerful, imaginative thing that could change lives and I would love to be a part of it. And that's kind of humbling, particularly when we think about corrections because so much of the rhetoric tends to suggest that, um, that not only do we obsess over the need to incarcerate people, but that we actually enjoy it. And this, this project so far suggested that that's not totally the case. Well, I, I think also um, at the kind of um, pure heart of the project, um, and, and when I've been talking about it with excitement in, in various interviews and such, um, to be able to, to take it down to, do we believe that great books are a good thing? You know, do we right. believe that reading actually opens minds? Do we believe that reading shows us other worlds? Do we believe that reading allows us uh, to imagine other lives? Uh, have you ever been changed by a book? Uh, have you ever been touched by a book? Have you ever had a soulful conversation with another human being about a book? If all of those things are true, uh, then to deny that uh, right, I would say, uh, to people who were incarcerated seems uh, it seems absurd. Yeah, you know, I was part of what, what, what like the backdrop of all of this is how difficult it is to get books in prison. I think that um, part of it also is the ability to acknowledge how absurdly fantastical us having this conversation is. You know, I went to prison when I was 16 and I didn't go to prison intending to be a writer and I said, I'm going to be a writer, not because I had any dreams of writing books, but because at 16, I thought to survive prison, I needed to decide to be something. And I love books. And so saying I would be a writer was like an easy choice. And to say I went from there to Black poets, to every shed I ain't sleep, to being at a prison with a librarian, had an interlibrary loan agreement with the public library and got me your poetry collection, which this was the only way that I could get a contemporary poetry book was through an interlibrary loan agreement because despite the library, the prison that I was in at that time having a decent library, the budgets are just the budget. And so they just didn't have money in a budget for a contemporary poetry book. And to say that I read your book and it touched me and then we could be having this conversation, you know, 15, 20 years later is, is just humbling. And so part of, part of it for me is how do I know that this is true and not try to do something that allows other people to have that opportunity? Given that my poetry book, I was really excited about having a hardback book, right? I was excited. I was like, I made it. I got a hardback poetry book. And then a friend said, you know, I can't get hardback books in here. And mm. I thought that I just like scale a mountain only to close off my words to a whole penitentiary full of readers. And so this project is about figuring out a way around all of those kind of um, challenges and figure out a way to bring contemporary work into the hands of, of men and women and, and young people in prison. Well, I, I think, you know, when, when, when you and I first met at the Kavi Kanam Poetry Workshop and you told me about how you encountered my work and, and the, the Kavi Kanam Poetry Workshop is a a space for for black poets and, and an extraordinary space for black poets. And uh are we figuring something out? Are we good? I bet I had your book right here and I started to grab it. Oh so I'm, I'm 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 really blind, so I don't want to go grab it. So I'm just gonna keep talking and then I'm gonna take a break in a minute to see if my eyesight is not failing me. And I'm gonna go grab the book because like one of the things that was super moving about that book is it still has the sticky notes in it. You know, it still has the highlights and the lines. Well, that was, that was, I mean, it was, it, you, you know, that, that, that space is very special and um, it is amazing meeting and working with, you know, poets who are um, uh, so devoted to their work. But um, the gift to me, besides the simple um, gift of your friendship, um, was that um, uh, you're telling me where my words had gone uh, and, and what they had, had meant to you. Um, was uh, just, it was very, very powerful to remember and to be humble about 
the sacred power of words that travel. Um, our words do travel and about the sanctity and preciousness of the book. Um, when I think in a different way, and, and I, I love to talk about, you know, uh, little Dwayne, the reader, um, when I think about um, being a, a young reader and how precious it was to, to, to have a book um, and how, how special it was to go to the library and to, to read through books so quickly. So my library was in DC was the one um, uh, off Pennsylvania Avenue on 8th Street, kind of heading over toward the Marine Barracks. Um, yeah. And uh, a you know, real kind of old school, beautiful library in hot DC summer days. You know, that was one of the things that we could do. We could walk there by ourselves and, and reading through piles of books as a little person and being able to then come back and borrow more books. Uh, felt positively like magic. And for me, my first black poet in hand was Lucille Clifton. And uh, and she was someone who I met for the first time in the context of Cave Canem. Uh, her first book, Good Times, was one, there were not many poetry books in my, there were many books in my house, but not many poetry books. But Good Times was one of them. And I would read over and over again, you know, here in the inner city, or like we call it, home. Home. Oh. You know, and and so, you know, lots of lots of circles happening all uh, around understanding that um, also you can take poems uh, into your into yourself, into your body. I should say I, I, I probably don't want to say this. I remember my local library, but but prison formed, you know, it was sort of the, the thing that like um, created my relationship with books. I, I, my local library was on Spalding Avenue in, in Suitland, Maryland. Mm -hmm. I remember dribbling my basketball there. I know that it was behind a piece of spot, right? I know that that was my local library. Mm -hmm. I also know that at a really young age, I developed a habit that I haven't broken yet, which is I got, I got locked up and I had books that I owed out. You know, I had books that I owed out to my grandmother's library in Virginia, I got Evelyn Woods speed reading book, right? <laughs> because I wanted, look, because I, I wanted to read fast. And this is me as a 15 year old. So I was, I was fond of libraries. I read, you know, I read Things Fall Apart. I remember reading Things Fall Apart and what devastated me was the fact that like a book could end in this way. I actually didn't understand the possibility of wanting to accomplish something that was righteous and just and then failing and not being able to handle the failure. Mm -hmm. and, and that like thing stayed with me. But but the point though, I'm, I'm rambling, except I wanted to say my real relationship with libraries weren't any of these moments. My real relationship with libraries, when I fell in love with librarians, was when I would fill out these request forms and ask for books. It's when all I had time to do was comb through a list of titles and I could only pick a book based on a name. So I mm. met John Edgar Wideman. I, I didn't meet him because somebody told me he was a great writer. Mm -hmm. I met him because, you know, the Homewood trilogy yeah. found it interesting. You know, I, I, I so it's so many writers that, you know, I felt train whistle guitar. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who Albert Murray, I just thought, who calls a book three words? You know, <laughs> I, when I read Sophie's Choice, I was looking for Sophie's world which is a completely different book and it's about philosophy. Huh. And so and, and a, a librarian convinced me that I couldn't want to read Sophie's World and I must be looking for Sophie's Choice. So mm -hmm. imagine me being 16 years old reading Sophie's Choice and I'm thinking that I'm suffering, right? Mm -hmm. I imagine that I'm struggling with the world and I never really thought seriously about the Holocaust and then I read this book. And then reading that book and encountering mm -hmm. that author leads me to the story of Matt Turner. And uh, so for me, you know, my relationship with books and with libraries and with librarians is, is like rooted in the experience of prison, which in many ways is tragic because we want people to find this joy. You know, I, I want for my sons to find Lucille Clifton's work, your work, outside of tragedy. And, 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 and yet, you know, it is what it is. And I've been given a great gift through words. And that's the kind of thing that I want this project to be an emblem of. 
that that words give us gifts in, in completely unexpected ways and, and that they humble us, but that they inspire us. And, and I hate the fact that people have to meet words in prison, but I think it's a duty as, as a writer and it's a duty as just a person living in this world to be a conduit, at least for me, it's my duty to be a conduit for more people to meet words um, in those desperate places we call prison. Well, and to, to add and, and, and to widen, um, you know, our, our, for, for our, our friends who are with us today, you know, a, 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 an even deeper and understanding of what words do, you know, beyond beauty, beyond joy, you know, is also, we could go on, vexation, uh, sharpening of, of, of thinking, um, the ability, I mean, I'm thinking of a, a million things of, you know, first reading James Baldwin say, right, the world is white no longer, and it will never be white again. You know, one of those great Baldwin sentences, but you know, all of the ways that our power of mind uh, is developed by reading and rereading and um, uh, engaging with what's uh, in books. Uh, so um, I would like to hear also um, from, from you, I mean, um, how you thought about the Million Book Project as such. Uh, how did it come to be in your mind? I will say it was it was two ways, right? The first way was I had a book. So you remember when when I got the book deal for the memoir, and I talked to a bunch of people, but I, I talked to you, and and one of the things you told me was to read um, "Always Running," Luis Rodriguez's book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but you also pushed me back to a black man says so gay, and in black interior. And I started thinking about how I shaped and framed my story. But the truth is that I was afraid that like um, my book wouldn't hit right to my guys in prison. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I sent it to nobody. And then a decade after it came out, roughly like maybe eight years after it came out, seven years, I, I, I got back in contact with a bunch of dudes I knew in prison. And one guy, he wanted um, to start a, he ended up wanting to start a reading group around the book because he thought that the book captured a lot of things that it was more important for folks to think about. And I was like pretty humbled that he liked the book and also he thought it could be a, a vehicle for something. And at the time, so I sent him 12 copies. Hmm. And then the prison, um, they put it on a, on, a, on a disapproved list. Now it was already in the prison, it was already in all the li libraries, but come on, who gets 12 copies of one book? And it's like, they were like, it has to be something wrong with this. You know, they were mm -hmm. probably looking at the book saying, it is something wrong. I just got to find it. Like who wants, nobody gets 12 copies of the same thing in a prison. Uh -huh. And anyway, um, I had a series of conversations with the people in the DLC and they took the book off the disapproved list and they gave it to my friend and he was able to start his thing. But the point is that I started like really thinking that it's, it's really easy and, and you guys push me too, but it's really easy to imagine envisioning a project that does something for me as a writer or does something for just my friend. But with that incident, conceptualized was that there wasn't enough belief in a sort of transformative power of reading. Like if, if 12 books arrive at anybody's doorstep today, the assumption would be they're starting a book club, they're buying gifts for friends, any of a number of legitimate reasons. But the initial thing in that prison was something must be wrong with this. And so I thought, how can, you know, how can I have an impact? How can I do something that is, um, like somebody asked me, I think you asked me, and I think I've been having conversations with Julie, and also I've been talking to um, my friend Lori Gruen, is like, how do you change your life in prison? How do you create a guide for yourself? And I thought, what if I said these were a set of books that led to a thousand and one stories? And mm -hmm. what would it mean to put that together and then also say, you know, everybody talks about prison censorship. And, and it's not that I don't believe that it's a thing. I believe it's a thing. But I got a friend that got sentenced to 53 years when he was 16 years old for a crime he didn't commit. Mm. He did 24 years before getting a conditional pardon. By the time he was incarcerated, he lost three habeas corpus petitions. He wrote half a dozen lawyers who said they wouldn't accept the case. Mm. And he's only out now because of his refusal to quit, right? And so I thought, how can I create something that forced me to go with this idea of reading literature and learning and possibility in a way that would challenge all of the no's. 
And so this this thing, and, and what would be fun? And what would be fun is saying, what would a literary time capsule, a collection look like that says, your freedom is coming. Mm. But how do I hold a place for you right now as you nurture that freedom? You know, so much of incarceration is saying, you got a 10 year sentence, you got a 20 year sentence. When you walk out of the door, then get ready. But mm. what does it mean to say you have to get ready now? Yeah. And, and that's what this project is about, saying that you have to get ready now. And, and, and how, um, uh, and actually before I ask you this, I want to just encourage you to, people to start putting their questions and comments in the chat section. We're not, we're not there yet, but if you could, could start, that would be great. Um, but um, what about some of the, the, the things that people are asking, the kind of brass tacks? Um, so how, in fact, will you deal with so you're gonna you're gonna put together with a a, a, a team of advisors the, the 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 freedom library the liberation library 500 books of all time right and 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 so how are you then going to get them in prisons what are you going to do when a book that's on that list is banned somewhere how are you physically going to get them in uh, you know what are what are the obstacles because you've thought them through very carefully so it's a couple of the challenges, right? I mean, um, frequently when books get banned, it's because you got to recognize that the book comes in and it's just a line level officer that looks at the book. So my book got banned momentarily because I do, I have a chapter called How to Make a Knife in Prison. <laughs> am I, am I going to argue with the warden who says, listen, you have a detailed explanation of how to make a shank. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna call that censorship. I'm gonna call that keeping people safe. Mm. But they didn't read the chapter. So then I was like, oh, no, no, wait. It's not a detailed explanation about how to make a shank. That was just me trying to be a poet and that's why I was called that. But really what it's about is how to avoid violence. And I, I made a point, I, I, when I told my friends that it got banned for that chapter, they started laughing at me. They was like, what? Your Fisher Price version of how to make a knife got banned? <laughs> It was like, you can find a better tutorial on the back of a cereal box. <laughs> and, so, and so like, so sometimes books get banned because of the optics and you just have to help clarify the optics. But I talked to somebody in another state and this person who teaches in a prison in a state that I won't name said that some people in my program get physically abused and threatened with violence because of the book they read. Mm, mm, mm. And so and so the question is, is my goal to choose this book or is my goal to make sure that the content that's in that book gets into the prison? And so that means that I might have to make choices. You know, I might have to say, um, you know, I won't even name a book, but I might have to say X book is not on the list because it doesn't make sense to sink the project over having a fight over a book that does intimately detail the ways in which people can be harmed, right? I might have to make that decision. But I think, you know, by and large, people want people to have access to literature. People want, and the books aren't just for prisoners. The books mm -hmm. are for guards. The books are for the administrative staff. You know, mm -hmm. this is a world that we live in in which we have tried to create every opportunity to say it's us versus them. But when I was in prison, most of those prisons I worked with the guys working in those prisons look like the people I knew on the street. You know, I know people right now in Virginia who will say, yeah, my homegirl works at this jail and this prison. These communities are intertwined. And so I'm not even attempting to create a project that suggests that it's necessarily us versus them. But then like brass tacks that you do have situations where it's a problem. And so I wanted to include women talking with a state that I'm working with right now. And the person that runs this this portion of the DLC, you know, highest level up said, for real, he asked me the question you asked me. Well, what about when we want to censor you? And mm -hmm. I was like, damn, I didn't know you were going to ask me that, you know? <laughs> and I said, I said, ideally, I'm going to convince you that you're misinformed. And so I, I proposed a book, Women Talking, by Miriam Powell. And if you look at the back cover, it says it's about the Mennonite community and the series of sexual assaults that occurred. Mm. Folks say, hey, look, all of these other books, great, but this, this seems triggering. This seems like it is gonna cause people to revisit past harms. Why would you include a book like this? And I said, hold fast. This book, this author specifically chose to start the, the story after the violence. 
And this mm-hmm. book is asking some profound philosophical questions about how to deal with suffering, how to deal with harm, how to continue to build a community and how to be within a community. And more importantly, the book is both moving and hilarious. And it centers the voice of women and it is just an amazing story. And I went on like this because I really love this book. So I went on like this for like 35 minutes, right? And I sent seven reviews of the book previously in an email. And they were like, oh, okay, I'm convinced. And I sent the follow-up email to say, are we good? Because they didn't tell me that they were convinced. They just didn't respond. So when we had the next call, I said, oh, yeah, I didn't hear back from you about women talking. Mm-hmm. And the head librarian and the guy that runs the deal, that, that runs this aspect of the DLC was like, oh, yeah, we heard your explanation. We straight. And, and so I'm not trying to paint a picture of, like, this is going to be easy and kumbaya. Mm-hmm. But I am trying to suggest that I, I don't want to overstate the challenges. And I want to say that it's 500 books, you know. I, if I can't find 500 amazing, brilliant, wonderful books, including children's books and YA books that need to be in prison without spending months and months in conflict, then I've already failed because people in prison know you got, you got to get to the win. You know, you can't sit around fighting and arguing all day. You got to figure out how to, how to get to the win. And for me, the win is, as you know, Lucille Clifton, is James Baldwin. It's so many books that I've learned to love and that we've learned to love in contemporary authors that people won't get a chance to read without a space like this. And, and can we talk a, a little bit more about um, the brass tacks of the how? Because I know that you're working uh, with uh, the great scholar Elizabeth Hinton and you'll, you're, you'll, you'll be um, sort of putting together this list of books with other people. Um, or maybe you and I can just do it now. Uh, you know, people are writing us at Mellon. I'm, I'm telling you, we get we get like all the time. People say, "I got some ideas for books uh, uh, and that should be on the list," which I think is also fantastic. If there is a whole conversation that's starting yeah. about what are what are the great books that are not necessarily the great books of a previous generation. So I, I see Rebecca Ginsburg in here, and this is somebody else that I'm leaning on. And what happens is, um, so one, you have people who have a breadth of knowledge and experience around every kind of issue that comes up with literature in prison. But two, you have these folks that have worked with people inside, and um, and and they, you know, so and, and they they have an ability to help us communicate with folks inside to build out this list. But it's two ways. It's sort of like founders, right? So me and Elizabeth are partnering to pick 250 books. Um, it's 500 kind of stealing this part of the idea from somebody else. The, the beauty of this is I've gotten to steal so many great ideas, right? But this idea, I'm still in the 250. It's basically 250 years close away from the Declaration of Independence. So I'm still in 250 um, books, and we're just going to like name them between me and Elizabeth. And then we have a multi-pronged approach to work with a curatorial committee to get the second 250. So first, we have a survey, which we will be making publicly available soon and we will be disseminating through different ways. The survey asks a number of questions about what book changed your life, uh, what book is necessary for your expertise of the world that you live in, and mm-hmm. also, like, have you ever had a book that you had to give to somebody else? I'm not talking about like a book that you love, but like a book that you read and thought, I need to buy two other copies of this, or I need to email a friend and say, this is amazing, um, that kind of book. And so I'm asking people, like, what is that book for you? And then it's a few, other questions on a survey. And the idea of the survey is just to create a whole bucket of books and a diverse bucket of books because, frankly, I haven't read anything. And then we're creating a number of focus groups. So we're creating a curatorial committee, and each curatorial committee um, member will be conducting two focus groups, 45 minutes each, with themselves and three friends. And not just like three, and, and the way that we're framing it is like you could take a, a friend of ours, like Nikki Davidoff, you could take Nikki, who's a brilliant writer. Mm-hmm. For the past, for, for the entire time of this pandemic, him and his mom, who's an 80 year old retired English teacher, they've been having a book club. And so when he hosts his focus group, he's going to pick people that he loves who have a strong relationship with books and literature. And so mm-hmm. he would have his mom. And there's no way that I would ever ask his mom because I don't know his mom. And so these folks, focus groups end up doing two things. One, they allow me to reach out to people that I love and, 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 and want to be invested in a project. And people that I admire and that I've always sort of thought that they should guide me in doing something. 
and I just got to find out what the thing is. And now I had a thing. But the other thing it does is like I was talking to another friend and I asked her if she would be a part of the committee and she admitted, you know, I don't read that much. And, and she has a job and she's the editor. So she was like, I, I mean, I read a lot for my job, but for Joy, and then she'd say, I wonder what my sister would say, because she reads all of the time. Mm-hmm. And so this whole idea of focus group allows me to lean on others to bring the people in um, that they love who love books. Mm. And then the last thing I'm doing is, again, I'm using this project as an opportunity to do things that I would have just loved to do anyway. And so how do I convince so many people that I admire and love and have followed and appreciate to sit down with me for 40 minutes to talk about the books that inspired us. And I got a running list and I've been reaching out to people and setting up interviews. And so over the next three months, I'm gonna conduct anywhere from 25 to 50 interviews with people who I consider like the light to the world. And um, I don't believe I just said that. That was, a I didn't even make, I didn't do that on purpose either. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, but, but, and sit down and, um, and invite them to talk about books. And the whole thing is all of this is to generate a bucket of books to choose from. And then think about the ways that those books overlap with what we already chosen. And then think about the ways that those books point us in directions we need to be in. And then mm-hmm. the other layer, so that's just the curation and collection of titles. The other layer of that is to do a, a, a series of, um, surveys or questionnaires within prison to create my, to create graphs around the gaps that exist in the prison. And like one obvious gap is children's literature. You do 15, 20 years in prison and you got a three-year-old, what do you read with them across the pathway of their life as they wait for you to be released from prison? And so we wanna just talk to folks on the inside to get a sense of what's there and what's missing and try to plug in gaps. But like ultimately, this is this is a Dr. Frankenstein project. It is, it is really, <laughs> You know, how do you create something that's like wholly idiosyncratic and maybe even in some ways absurd? And then, and this is what we haven't talked about, the sculpture that Titus is producing. Um, how do you take this thing and then think about presentation? You know, my bookshelf is in my office and um, and it, I, I we bought this house from this guy. He built a bookshelf and it's stacked with cinder blocks and it's just wood. And the, the, the bookshelf itself is a sculpture. And I look at the books and the books are, you know, they like, all out of whack. Some of them are straight up. Some of them are um, sitting on on their on their backs. I got a, a a set of cards with um. This is everything here. I got I got three Rubik's cubes on the bookshelf. And so the point is that my shelf and most people's bookshelves are like sculptures that say something about how they live. And so we want to create something that does that. You know, that frames the books in a really particular way, but also says something about how we live. I mean, imagine doing twenty years in prison and never walking past the most intimate thing that exists outside of my relationship with my wife and children in my life, which is a bookshelf, right? Mm. Imagine doing 20 years and never having the opportunity to walk past a bookshelf that is as idiosyncratic and reckless as the person that chose all of those books. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, that, and it's just like profoundly, profoundly sad to, 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 to think that we have a system in a world in which the, the fundamental thing that has been necessary for my existence doesn't exist, period, for so many people. Mm-hmm. And so um, I don't know if all of those things make sense, but I, but, but I think it's like gumbo, you know, and, and, and on the front end, it, it is a lot of experimentation to get to that last 250. But, but like, you know, we publish 3 million books a year. 250 isn't a big member. And so we're trying to cast the net as wide as possible and engender the kind of conversations that allow us to report back to the world and say, you know what? A woman told me that her book was Joan Didion's um, The Year of Magical Thinking Mm -hmm. because her stepmother passed and she read that book that year. She's read it every year since for 13 years. I I just want to be able to tell that story. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's it's the kind of intimacy that comes with reading and I think comes with nothing else. And we're trying to tap into that intimacy as we build this, this this collection. And what about a few more details, and I'm pulling from um, the, the the questions as well, um, about the specifics of how you're working with um, uh, prison officials, state departments of corrections, uh, and a little, little bit of the nitty gritty of what that's all about. Uh, part of that is like, again, 
we we build out a team of consultants. Uh, so I take an opportunity to shout out people who are really, really amazing. So um, Debbie Mukamal, who uh, runs a clinic at Stanford, is amazing. And she made the connection um, with me to um, to the people at CDCR. And so what that looked like is we just had a call and I pitched the project to him and discussed the project. And then um, Brantley Choke, he put his team together and we had a series of calls that followed that. And I'm working with the head library in there to, to let them know, first we're doing like a kind of book of the month club, because it'll take six, it'll take six months to curate the 500 books, but we don't want to reach out to prison and then like go radio silence. And so we created a book of the month club that um, consists of a number of books that we can send titles in for now. And so I've been working with her on that list of 10 and on the prisons to pilot the program with. And that's, that's basically the, the, the sort of template. That's the, best practice approach to doing this project is you talk to the person that's at the very top and they put together the team of people that's required to make it happen. And then, you know, I convince them of the value of the work and it goes down and I end up talking to a number of people within the system that has a stake in it. But then like another interesting aspect is, you know, I find myself talking to other people who, um, who run different kinds of programs who help me think about how to bring the books into prisons in a particular way. And so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll bring in like, for instance, We'll be bringing it. It's a, it's a couple of projects where you have um, solitary confinement units where the, the guards are reading books with the guys in solitary. And it's all about like building relationships and trying to trying to break down some of the tension, but also trying to create different relationships between the two. And mm -hmm. uh, and so we we plan on piling in certain books and programs like that. I should say the biggest challenge to the project that I wasn't aware of is it is both a national project and a local project. And because it's both a national project and a local project, I'm required and we are required to think seriously about the needs of particular prisons and try to approach them with what they need, understanding that, you know, we had the ability to facilitate some of that within getting the um the libraries into prison, the the, mm -hmm. the sort of time capsules in the prison. Mm -hmm. And then what about, um, also we have um, two questions, one from Maribel Mori or More and from um, Laura Ayala about uh, global contexts for the reading, uh, the readings, are there, are, are there going to be books from uh, world literature traditions and also specifically about um, uh, Latinx uh, incarcerated people and, um, and books, uh, literature in Spanish uh, and, and the graphics. Yeah, yeah. I started to start speaking Spanish, but then I feel like I was going to get clowned by like the several people who clowned all of the presidential candidates who decided that they wanted to flex that <laughs> Spanish. And, and mine is worse than all of theirs, so I won't even I won't even go there. Go ahead with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, but see, so hablo espanol, pero yo hablo espanol porque cuando hablo en prisión, and then I can't really say the word. But when I was in prison, you know, one of the first guys that took up for me was this cat that was Latino. And um and I remember going in the cell with him later, and it was me, him, and two of his homeboys. And he spoke English well, but his homeboys didn't. And I remember trying to chop it up with him and not being able to. Mm. And so fast forward a year, I see this young black dude with a book in his hand and it's in Spanish. And I'm like, yo, what's that? He give it to me. I see it's in Spanish. I'm like, oh man, where are you from? He like Norfolk. I'm like, come <laughs> on, man. Where your mama from? And he like mm. Norfolk. And I like, you know exactly what I'm asking you. How do you speak Spanish? And I, I didn't even realize how like offensive the question was and, and how he was hip to it, but I was young. And so he was teaching me something in terms of like, how was I deciding to, 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 to like choose where his whole family came from because of the knowledge he carried around in his head? Cause he was just a young black dude. You know, he mm -hmm. looked just like, me. and I just decided because he spoke Spanish, he had to be Dominican, right? He was like, I learned Spanish. I taught myself Spanish with a book. And and so, you know, that was my first year in prison, second year. It took me five or six years for it to roll back around, but I actually taught myself Spanish uh, while I was in prison and I taught myself Spanish with books. And so um, I remember, you know, I spent five, six hours a day um, reading this history book in Spanish with a dictionary and I struggled through it. And I, I say all of that to say that, of course, in Puerto Rico, the intention is to have 50, 60% of the books be in Spanish. And also for it to be really mindful world literature, 
that's part of the point of asking so many people to think and contribute to this so that we can think about what's necessary. They have classics tr that's in translation. How can we not have Marquez? Mm -hmm. You know, so with certain people, um, how can we not have in the time of butterf butterflies or something from Allende? How can we not have um, Sandra Cisneros? And so with certain people who, who like have to exist anyway, and mm -hmm. they might exist in translation or they might exist in their original languages um, or their native tongues. And I think that's the case, not just for, it's for the case for haiku as well. Now, I think Spanish exists in a really different space in the United States, right? It right. makes sense to have some Spanish language books because we have a lot of native Spanish speakers. Felon was reprinted in, in French, but it just doesn't really make much, French, much sense to have like French language books necessarily. But mm -hmm. we might come across um, prisons or, or we might come across prisons that we work with where it's like, yo, you know, we have a huge population of people who speak like X language and you got this, but can you help us work this out with, with, with books that actually appeal to them? And so I think it takes us to be really thoughtful and it's not like a numbers game, right? But we do have to find ways. Spanish is a given. Other languages, not so much so. And, and language and translation that acknowledges the world is just also a, a given. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's one of the reasons really why um, we have to be as sort of grassroots oriented in selecting the books. Because otherwise, you know, I mean, I am just me, you know, and, and I would just be picking really classics of mostly and primarily black literature. But, but this isn't a black history project, right? I mean, I gotta go to South Dakota, I gotta go to Montana, and I gotta, uh, I gotta acknowledge um, the great writing that I know that exists that's written from people who live all across this country. And I want local writers in every state to go inside their institutions. And if I want that, I have to use this project as an opportunity to make me a little bit more fluent in the whole landscape of literature across this country and the way in which the writers across this country reflect the landscape of literature across the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's uh, And then what about, and I'm thinking also though of all the things that are in the black tradition, history, literature, and all of it, squarely addressing the question of freedom, uh, which uh, of course is a, uh, a fundamental uh, question uh, when you think about the context. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I, yeah. No, I think, that's, I think that's my core though. You know, I think, I mean, I think that that's me and Elizabeth, that's our pocket. Black <laughs> Reconstruction, you know, Frederick Douglass, Phyllis Wheatley, and, and thinking about some of those older works, but not the works like everybody knows, um, and then I blank, but everybody knows so is the black folks, right? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's gonna exist in prison libraries because everybody knows it. Everybody knows um, the life and times of Frederick Douglass, but he wrote three you know, memoirs. And so mm -hmm. the idea becomes, what does it look like to pair the third memoir with, excuse me, with Blight's recent biography of Douglas. And what does it look like not to have so as a black folks, but to have black reconstruction and to have Khalil Muhammad's The Condemnation of Blackness. Mm -hmm. And how do you arrange these in a way in which we suggest the conversation that happens between these books? Yeah. And how do you hook, you know, the old with the new? I mean, I, I think that, um, and then for us, you know, how do we think about the way so much other world literature is actually roped into this? I should say, um, one of my advisory board members uh, Ruthie Gilmore, mm. sort of like, she was like, I'd love to be a advisory board member, but I kind of think I should be involved with this curatorial thing because there's some stuff that we got to make sure gets in there. And, um, and what she was saying, and this is, you know, one of the people who is deeply interested in poetry and deeply interested in literature, but also deeply interested in freedom. And so I have to have people around me like that who make sure that I'm aware of the touchstones that can exist within a project like this that I might be blind to. But um, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I fully expect it to be a, a pathway and I fully expect, I guess, my own ambition is to create a kind of conversation around some of these books that I that I love and that I actually need to engage with more deeply because I've read them when I was a teenager in prison. And I get to revisit them now as a 40 year old with a kid that's about to be a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I get to engage with it and ask myself, how do these books work together? <laughs> My son, oh, I shouldn't even say this. He's gonna be mad if he ever sees this. <laughs> but um, he wants a cell phone. And so one of the things that I made him do is write a series of essays this summer. 
So he's been reading James Baldwin. Nobody <laughs> knows my name, notes of a native son. And, and, and he's been writing essays in response to Baldwin. And so the question becomes, like, how do I create some type of mechanism that um, allows for the possibility of the kind of engagement that he's having, literally with another world, you know, yeah. a world he just doesn't know at all. Um, we're gonna, we're, um, time is going so fast. I'm gonna pull a few more things from the questions and we're gonna end with um, sharing poems, uh, you and me, Mr. Betts. Um, but, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but before that, um, uh, just if you could say more about thinking about women and young people in particular. I mean, I, I love what you said about people who um, would be reading children's books because they'd be reading them with their, their own children. But um, could you say more, and since we were on your, your, your son's age group as well, uh, about thinking particularly about young people and particularly about women when you're um, putting together collections for those facilities? Yes, yeah, so I think for young people, it's kind of challenging. And that's why we have reading experts on the team to think about how to make sure that it's a bandwidth within this. But, you know, we live in a world in which the, the, the YA books are just being churned out consistently. And you have somebody like Jason Reynolds that's not only writing amazing work, um, but he's writing amazing work that I, I was um, I was teaching a, a, a poetry workshop with teenagers and one kid started explaining um, that Jason, Jason Reynolds long way down. Cause I asked him the same focus group, what book do you love? And he said one thing and he said, no, 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 forget that. I need to tell you about Jason Reynolds book long way down. And so part of what I'm doing is having these conversations with young people about the books that really affect them. We, we had, um, I, I, I coached the basketball team with James Foreman and, um, and we gave all the kids with well, James Foreman and, and Marcus, um, and, you know, whatever, you know, these people, that's why I mentioned their names, but I coached with James and Marcus, but at the end of the season, um, we gave every kid a book and it was like really cool to think about what they would want to read. And so part of that process is just really being familiar with, with YA books, really being familiar with the Rick Riordans, but also being familiar uh, with the Jason Reynolds and, and just being familiar with the whole bandwidth of contemporary YA authors um, who I've left out a, a lot in this conversation. And then with women, I, I've been into a few women's prisons and part of that is really for me to you know recognize that women tend to want to read the same books that everybody else wants to read, but that I really do need to talk to them and think about um, what speaks specifically um, to the gap that might exist in the literature that's out there for them. Like, how do I make sure that it's both the Audre Lords and the Caitlin Greenridges? You know, how do I make sure that um, Chimamanda Adichie exists in the collection? And how do I make sure that the representation among women um, isn't, you know, it, it, it isn't just like a an afterthought and that mm -hmm. and that requires me to do a little bit um more thinking but also i think it requires i mean the first seven people that we invited to the advisory board were women i feel mm -hmm. i feel real good about saying that you know it's like i recognize that for this project to exist the guidance that i need to shape some of the things that i have real gaps on and real holes on um is going to come from what i'm thinking about women and what i'm thinking about the relationship that women have with books and also that women have with incarceration Sheila mm -hmm. Betty um, is another one of my advisors and to speak about Debbie, I mean, she's on a project right now that's trying to count and track the number of women currently incarcerated that have experienced domestic violence or intimate partner abuse. Mm -hmm. And that number is like the majority. It's like right now it's like more than 60, 70% of women. And so what does that mean about having like literature that both kind of acknowledges that, but also literature that's not thinking about that as a problem that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But it's about it as like another thread that has to be explored within what we're doing. Um, but it's, you know, the beauty of it all is that every conversation raises a number of questions that have to be answered. And if I take answering those questions seriously, I lean on the team that we've already developed um, in, in the, the Million Book Project within the Justice Collaboratory. And also I just lean on my friendships and my relationships with a lot of like brilliant folks. Mm. Well, um, this has been an amazing conversation and what you should know is that there are lots and lots of people who are asking about how they can be involved, how they can support the project. So we'll make sure that we keep track of all of that. Um, but um, it's always the right thing to conclude with poems. Um, and uh, so uh, I'll start and you'll close. How about that? 
Sounds good. Okay, I've been so I'll, I've been figuring out. There are a lot. Of, I'm reading a poem to you, um, but there and there are so many. There were so many things I wanted uh, wanted to share. But um, I was uh, today watching some of um, John Lewis's funeral um, today, and uh, and watching him be eulogized, and thinking about um, what it is when we lose an elder, but they leave us with such a clear sense of what our work is, um, and. Yeah. Uh, so I have that on my mind. Um, and uh, so this poem is called Black Poets Talk About the Dead. Like Tony, he said, who came plain as day to my dream last night in a gangster beret, tangerine colored suit, thigh high go-go boots. She tipped that brim and said, how you like me now? After Etheridge passed, I went to see his woman with my daughter, who was six at the time and had loved him. We slept in the room where he'd slept, and in the night my child woke up and said, I was talking to Etheridge just now. Can't you smell his cigarettes? After she left us, we felt mom close. She had passed, but not crossed. And those were good weeks her soup in the freezer, perfume in her handkerchiefs, half empty cups of her tea grown cold. But bit by bit, she left and then was gone. They do that so we can mourn. They do that so we believe it. It is what it is, wretched work, that we who the dead leave behind must do. So that is for you, uh, Mr. Betts. Mm. Yeah, that was, that was actually literally for me. Um, all right, I'm gonna read essay on re-entry. My kid came in in the middle of this and he was like, oh, it looked like daddy busy, so I'm just gonna leave. Uh -huh. I'm gonna read this poem I wrote for him. Essay on re-entry. At 2 a.m., without enough spirit spilling into my liver to know to keep my mouth shut, my youngest learned of years I spent inside a box, a spell, a kind of incantation I was under, not whiskey, but history. I robbed a man. This, months before Miles would drop bucket after bucket, on opposing players. The entire B draggle bunch five and six and he leaping as if every layup erases something. That's how I saw it. My screaming, coaching, sweating presence recompense for the pen. My father has never seen me play ball as part of this. My oldest knew, told of my crimes by a stranger. Tell me we aren't running towards failure is what I want to ask my son. But it is two in the a.m. The oldest has gone off the dream and the comfort of his room. The youngest, despite him seeming more lucid than me, just reflects cartoons back from his eyes. So when he tells me, Daddy, it's okay, I know what's happening is some scraggling angel lost from his pack finding a way to fulfill his duty, lending words to this kid who crawls into my arms, wanting more than stories of my prison, the sleep that he fought while I held court at a bar with men who knew that when the drinking was done, the drinking wouldn't make the stories we brought home any easier to tell. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. I, I should say that it's um it's really humbling. And um yeah, that is really humbling. Listen, you know, um I don't have any words to put on top of the words except one of the things that we have in common and no one understand uh is that the words of our our, our poets are our words. 
the things that we've read in those books are our, our real life. Uh, and so, you know, I think of uh, uh, One Love We Share, Gwendolyn Brooks and her great poem, Infirm. And when she says, we are all infirm, oh, mend me, Lord. And uh, so I think uh, that there is, is, is much power uh, in understanding um, our common denominators uh, and uh, our potential uh, for healing and growing and learning uh, together. And you know, I mean, you know, Brooks was, I mean, she was writing men in prison. It was a part of, it was a part of the responsibility and a part of the practice. But I think that, um, that this really is us continuing that tradition, recognizing that it's, it is, so you can, you know, it's, it's, and it's a lot of people that we got this from, from after Bert Miller to, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks to you, just people who like wrote letters and returned and wrote poems. And I think it's important to find ways to honor that. And this is a, a, a beautiful way. So I thank you, I thank Melon, and I thank everybody who's tuning in. And it was a lot of great questions that, that we will answer. We'll find ways to answer those questions on Twitter, um, in the newsletter that we'll be putting out. And so thank you guys for, for tuning in. Yes, thank you everybody uh, for coming together. Thank you, thank you, Dwayne. Thank you all of the hands that work so hard to um, make this event possible and all the hands that uh, work so hard to make the million books possible. So as far as the voice can reach, uh, uh, love. Peace. Okay.